Welcome back to the Tar Heel Illustrated Podcast. I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner, and alongside me, as he usually is, well, not alongside me, I should say. I'm so used to saying that, AJ, but through the phone, on the other side of the phone in my situation, a THI publisher, Andrew Jones. Andrew, how you doing, man? I'm doing all right, and you're through my laptop, so we're using different devices. We're eight miles apart, so all the uh, social media or social distancing warriors out there would be very proud of us. <laughs> they, really, they should be, man. We, we've been pumping out a lot of these uh, – Zoom podcast and whatnot. I hope you guys have been enjoying. I know I've been, I've been producing a lot of these and been kind of in the background, but I know AJ Clinton Dean have been doing a really good job talking basketball and football recruiting. So I've really enjoyed putting these together and finally glad to, to be on one and, and talk some some spring football. Obviously, Carolina did not have their spring football practice, um, but in this one, we're going to be talking about uh, three things three things to look at on the defensive side of the ball um, going into to this season. We don't know. We, we've speculated a little bit. Uh, we touched on it in, in some other videos where we talked about Carolina maybe having a, a shortened uh, fall camp coming up. We just, nobody really knows anything and how, how the uh, coronavirus situation is going to pan out over the next couple months and when the season is going to start. Nobody knows. Pure, pure speculation. But Carolina did not have the spring practice. But there's still a few positives and, and a few things to look at, um, especially on the defensive side of the ball, AJ. The first thing I want to talk about is not necessarily a positive, but Carolina, uh, the defensive tackle position especially, it's pretty thin. They, 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 they had Aaron Crawford there last year. So AJ, you wrote a piece on it, what, a week ago? Pretty recent. Yeah. Um, talking about um, that there's, there's still some, some optimism there, at, despite it being pretty thin. You got Jason Sturbridge going to the NFL, Aaron Crawford getting a shot in the NFL. But Carolina's got some guys that they think can maybe step in there. Jaleel Taylor's been talked about a lot. Ray Bahasic's been talked about a lot as well. AJ, so – Pretty thin position for the Heels right now, especially when you consider, you know, Sturbridge and Crawford were, had really good seasons last year. Two older guys, two leaders in that room. But looking at it, I mean, you still got some guys that, that can step up and, and fill some holes. And there's still some, some things to be op- optimistic about at that uh, defensive tackle position, especially. Well, e- even though we didn't, there was, we didn't have a spring football to cover, uh, we got the availability with – with some of the coaches, including Jay Bateman, the defensive coordinator. <clears throat> we got linebacker Chaz Surratt, and we're going to get some others through May and perhaps into, into even June. And one of the things that we talked a lot with Jay Bateman about was the defensive front. And even with Stephen, with Chaz, you know, who, who, actually we also talked to Jason Strobridge uh, in, in the week of the uh, NFL draft, and he was asked a few questions about you know, who to look out for, who should we look out for in the defensive line. He had some interesting answers. Of course, Jaleel Taylor was one of them. I think Jaleel Taylor is sort of where you start <clears throat> with the defensive line. He's got some experience. He played well enough late last season that they were able to move Jason Strobridge outside a little bit more, which actually helped Strobridge get drafted. <clears throat> Excuse me. It helped Strobridge get drafted because he's probably more of an outside guy than an inside guy in the NFL. So he's able to display his skills. But it only happened because Taylor got better and better and better. I think he'll be the the blocker occupier, as I like to call it, in, in the front of the line. I think he'll be the nose tackle. I think he's going to be the Aaron Crawford, a guy that has to eat up blockers and allow um, the other guys around him to make plays. So he may not rack up a ton of stats, but that's not necessarily going to be his job. They have to have a guy like that up front, really, to make everything else work the way it needs to work. So they actually feel pretty good about that part of the line. I think they also feel pretty good about Ray Bahasic because he came on and played pretty well late last year as well. The majority of his reps were in the last four or five games of the season. Part of that was he was still coming, you know, overcoming an injury he, he experienced in junior college. Uh, he couldn't lift weights for a long time. They started getting him into a weight training program. It had been a long time since he really did the kind of weight training you, would, you typically would expect from a football player, especially a lineman. So expect a significant jump from him. The question, however, with him is going to be how many snaps can he give you? Is he a 30-snap guy, a 40-snap or a 50-snap-a-game guy? We don't really know, and I'm not sure they know yet. They'll have to find out. That's why they need some depth, and that's where some of the questions are. Zach Gill hasn't given him a lot yet, and I know that they love his potential, but potential could be a dangerous word especially when it's not yet tapped and the guy's been there a couple of years. So this is going to – we talked about the fork in the road year for William Barnes on offense. I think this is going to be a fork in the road year for Zach Gill on defense. I don't know if any of the new kids are really going to be able to give him anything yet because that's such a hard thing to do as a true freshman. But they'll certainly look. I think what happens on on the outside with guys like Tamon Fox, who's 
linebacker. We kind of have fun with Jay Bateman about what to call his position. But I think they're in pretty good shape on those edges. I think you're going to see KBJ, a true freshman, who might get some reps on the field. You're going to see guys like Chris Collins. They have Tyrone Hopper. They have some pretty solid guys on the edges there. It's just those, those spots um, in the interior line that are a little bit of a question mark. And it is thin. And we really don't know what they're going to be until we actually see them get on the field, Jacob, and, and see who they are, especially once they get through a grind. And they're going to be thrown to the wolves right away at Central Florida and then Auburn down in Atlanta. You know, I, Auburn, I, it's going to be interesting to see how they deal with Auburn's front line. And honestly, as, as good as the defense is behind the front line, the front line has to be at least solid for the rest of that defense to be really good. And that's going to be the question going into the season. Of all the things that this team has, the biggest question mark is up front defensively. Yeah, AJ, I think you're, you're perfectly right on that. I mean, you talked about the, the, them, the uh, defense needing a solid defensive front uh, to, to be good behind them. But you, know, you look at a position group last season that didn't have a lot of depth. It actually still performed pretty well. Was it at that linebacker group right behind the defensive line? Yeah, Chaz Surratt having a, a stellar breakout season at that position. Jeremiah Gimmel playing a ton of snaps. Didn't really get the attention that Chaz Surratt got, but still really got a lot of um, positive things about him. I mean, Jay Bateman, uh, Jay Bateman talks about him a lot and how good he is, how much of a leader he is out there, and how he kind of controls that defense, calls the shots out there. So you got those two guys at that linebacker position. And now you got guys like uh, Kaji Jackson, Eugene Asante, they got a lot of reps, uh, particularly in that Mercer game a little bit later in the season. You got guys like that that can step in. You got Kamon Rucker, Ethan West. Um, coming in through freshman, and maybe we'll get some looks as well. So that linebacker position right now, AJ, is a lot deeper than it was this uh, was this time last season, especially when you consider how well, like I mentioned, Jeremiah Gimlin and Chad Surratt played. I mean, Jay Bateman's got to be feeling good about that linebacker core, especially if he can get the same kind of production that he got out of it, his starters and, and Gimlin and Surratt coming uh, that last season and going into next season. It's hard to imagine a position group being a greater unknown than what linebacker was this time a year ago. They had no clue. They had no idea what they had. They had no idea what they had in, in chats, really, until he got on the field. They, 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 they thought he could be pretty good, but you got to you gotta see it. You got to throw a guy out there. He's got to be physical. That was one of the questions, you know, how would he handle the physicality? And if you remember him as a quarterback, he was a pretty physical runner. The one game he played two years ago, the Miami game where he got hurt, he dragged the guy into the end zone, one of the touchdowns he scored. And so I, I think the physical part, uh, is something that Chaz embraced, and that was big because he had everything else. He's got the speed. He's got the leverage. He's got, as Tommy Thigpen told us here a couple of days ago, he's, he's very cerebral. Gimbal's very cerebral. I think one of the important developments early last year with that group was how quickly Gimbal got it and was able to bark stuff out. And the, Jay Bateman's defense is so predicated on on – I wouldn't you – know, on offense, it'd be called misdirection. On defense, it, it's kind of the inverted reality of that, where you, you show one thing, but you do something else. You, you, and, and they were the aggressors sometimes, too. And and that's important to have a guy out there in the middle of that defense that understands that and kind of get people in the right place and make sure everything is kosher. And Gimbal did a really good job of that. As it turned out, Chaz was second in the ACC in tackles. He was runner-up for ACC Defensive Player of the Year, and that's – given the number of mistakes he made, too, which he openly discusses. And Gimbal had 84 tackles. You know, he, he was a stabilizer out there. He wasn't always great, but he was usually pretty solid. I think for that group this year, Gimbal needs to be more than solid, and he needs to be more than solid every week, especially with the question marks up front. And Chaz needs to be great. Chaz has the potential to be great. He has the potential to be an NFL, a high NFL draft pick. He's got to be that guy every week. The mistakes he made last year, part of which was just understanding angles as a linebacker, angles to the ball, angles to the ball carrier, angles to the guy you're covering, you know, economizing on your movement more. Chaz needs to take that step. That's been a point of emphasis in the offseason. If he does take that step, you could have a first-team All-America linebacker. You could have a first, second-team All-ACC caliber linebacker back there. And then think about the depth factor that you brought up. Asante and Jackson – they love them. You know, Longo told, or not Longo, Bateman told us a couple weeks ago, look, if, if suddenly Jeremiah and Chaz weren't around and they had to go with those two guys, they'd feel really good about linebacker. Now, they didn't get a ton of linebacker reps in the high 40s, I think, for the season. As you mentioned, most were in the Mercer game. But they both played a lot on special teams. 
Now, they were both in the 200 play range for the season because of special teams. So they've been on the field. They, you, you, it doesn't get more physical than it does on special teams. So, so they've gone through all that. So when they get their 15 snaps a game this year, they will already understand the physicality of it. They're incredibly athletic. I didn't think I told us the other day that Asante's faster. I think he said Asante's faster than, than Chaz, which is pretty remarkable when you think about it. So with that group right there, with that force of an inside linebacker, they feel really, really good. And I think Ethan West down the road, they're going to feel pretty good about him, and, and, and they'll see what else they do at that position. But they're in excellent shape there. And, and the other linebacker spot where Dominique Ross had, there's going to be a third linebacker. But I don't think we're going to see a third linebacker a lot because the next thing we're going to talk about, the secondary is so deep, and, and they're going to have established guys at nickel. It's not going to be a rotating guy at nickel all the time. They're going to have more stability there. And that nickel is sort of a DB mock linebacker. <clears throat> it got so bad last year with injuries, they actually had to move Dominic Ross to nickel at times. I don't think we're going to see any of that now. And so we're probably going to see two linebackers on the field a higher percentage of the time than we did any time last year. Absolutely. I think the linebacker position is a, a, a very positive group. Like I said, especially consider how well Gimlin and Chad Surratt played last season with really minimal depth behind them, AJ. But perfect segue you kind of touched on there at the end of that was the second day. I think for me, it's one of the it's one of the craziest season to season transitions I've ever seen because if you look at Carolina's secondary last year, it was probably the most depleted on the team with all the injuries they had. A lot of young guys, Storm Duck, Don Chapman had to step up, even Cameron Kelly and just started in the Clemson game and ended up getting hurt. So it was just a – it was a crazy season for the secondary. But now, I mean, this is – I think it's definitely the deepest position group on the on the team, and I don't think anybody can really argue that. I mean, you've got a lot of guys returning. So just to name guys that didn't even really play – didn't play at all last year. you got Bryson Richardson who got hurt in the spring game coming back. You've got Kyler McMichael, Clemson transfer, had to sit out last year. Bryce Watts, Virginia Tech transfer, had to sit out last year. Patrice Rene got hurt in the Miami game. So there's four guys right there, all very capable players, guys that have – two guys, three guys really, all four of them, I guess you could say, have already kind of proven that they can play at the ACC level. So you got those guys coming in who didn't get any reps last season. And you've got guys like Storm, Trey Morrison, Cameron Kelly, um, DeAndre Hollins, Don Chapman, DJ Ford. I mean, you, the list just really goes on. you got a guy like Cameron Rose and Sinclair coming in as a true freshman. Carolina secondary this season is absolutely deep, and I know – been talked a lot about it and was very excited to see what that group does this season, AJ. But that's secondary, man. When you just look at how deep they are compared to what they were like last season, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And, and you got to really be feeling very positive about, about the secondary going into this season. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think there's any question. It's the deepest position. You're about. I think that they, the staff feels like that they can go 13 deep with guys back there. And the 13th guy is pretty good. Like if Bryson Richardson's your 13th guy, pretty good yeah he's a guy with an upside he's a guy that they like and you know, they like having around what's interesting is you bring in Connor Michael from Clemson he's got a national championship ring by the way played 101 snaps at Clemson he was a top 100 rivals guy so two years this time two years ago he's a top 100 rivals guy All right so he plays 101 snaps at Clemson decides he wants to go find something else he was at Clemson a lot of guys don't get on the field right away at Clemson He's someone that I know that they love the potential that he has. Bryce Watts played 25 games at Virginia Tech. Sat out last year. He's got a ton of experience. Played <clears throat> against Carolina a couple of years ago. Then you've got Patrice Renee, who was injured in the second game last year out of the season. Think way back in near prehistoric times when Carolina played Georgia in the Georgia Dome a few years ago. You know when Mitch Trubisky, his first career start at quarterback, Patrice Rene factored in the outcome of that game with a couple of tough calls in the third quarter. He was a true freshman. That was his first college game. Oh, by the way, Tamont Fox played in that game too. They're still in the program. The, the number, uh, maybe I'll do it this summer when I have time. Uh, maybe I'm going to add up the number of accumulative days spent as a college football player for that whole group back there. Because it's a lot. Because Renee has been a college football player for four years now. He's entering, he's into his fifth year. He's seen a ton. You know, Watts has seen a ton. Um, the other guys that are back there, Miles Wolfolk has seen a ton. He was injured last year. He led the team in interceptions and only played like in five or six games. They're, they're loaded. I don't know if how 
good the high-end guys are. Sometimes you can have a lot of depth and the drop-off isn't that great because the, the first guy isn't great, but the 13th guy is really good for that spot. We'll have to see. And I think being healthy and the competition that they'll have, because I know the staff said they can't wait for the competition in August with this group to figure out what the pecking orders mean. They're going to let these guys decide who's going to play. But they love the potential. A guy like Duck could be a great player one day. I think a lot of people feel that way. Uh, Cameron Kelly, like you said, he got hurt. He started the Clemson game <clears throat> as a true freshman. They love his upside. I mean, they love the upside of all these guys. So throw them all out there on the field. Let them compete. You may have different starting lineups in the secondary throughout the course of the season, which isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as, the guy, as, long as it's because guys are winning the opportunity. They're earning the opportunity down the field, and it's not by default because somebody's not playing well. Uh, I think they have a shot at being an outstanding group, and they're going to have Nichols. By the way, you didn't mention DJ Ford. I didn't mention him yet. Love this kid. Talk about another cerebral player. He's a guy you can maybe see at nickel. They have guys that can play nickel, real nickels. And I think that was something that Jay Bateman emphasized as well. Dominic Ross wasn't a nickel, but he had to play nickel some last year. DeAndre Hollins was always a corner, but they kind of worked him into nickel. And he got thrown to the wolves when I think it was the Duke game and did pretty well. So I say 13 guys back there can start a college football game and do well. That's pretty damn good. That's a that's a fantastic group back there. I can't wait to watch them in practice when they're all doing stuff together. And it's like, gee, who should I focus on this minute? Well, hopefully they'll give us enough time just watching that group so we can take each of them in individually because that'll be a lot of fun. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that nickel position because actually, I actually wrote a story. You remember this. Um, after we <laughs> talked to Jay Bateman, I actually wrote a story on Trey Morrison, a guy that you know started at nickel his true freshman season. And Jay Bateman kind of talked about with the depth they have there now, Trey played primarily at quarterback last year because they just didn't have a lot of depth there. It suffered a few injuries, kind of had a, a tough season as well on the injury front. But you got a guy that shined there as a true freshman, and, and now you can kind of, you have that option of at least playing him there on some snaps too that Carolina didn't have last season. So I think I'm glad you mentioned that nickel position because that's another group that is just extremely deep and, and has more options now because, like you mentioned, Dominique Ross isn't a guy that – you want to be playing there every single play. And that's kind of what had to happen a lot last season just because Carolina didn't have that depth there. Off the top of my head, I have I know once we finish this, I'm going to run through and, and verify it, but I think there are at least four DBs that have played nickel in college. So, and, and they've had used other guys that have moved on that played some nickel. So, but nickel is very important, as we were saying about the linebackers position. You know, two linebackers on the field, because they're going to run five DBs, one of them obviously being a nickel. But the nickel has to be able to play the run and the pass. And I think they, one of the reasons that Trey Morrison made sense there two years ago to that staff and might make sense again now is because he can play the run and he can also defend like a DB. And that's that's kind of one of the intricate things about that spot and having it work right in Jay Bateman's defense. He's got to be a guy that can do a little bit of everything. So it'll be interesting really to watch that shape up because there might be someone that starts – in, in Orlando at nickel that we may go into fall camp thinking, hmm, I don't know. I'm not sure where that guy's going to end up. I'm <clears throat> not sure who the starter is going to be, and suddenly somebody will emerge. That's going to be, I think, maybe the most fun part about fall camp is that group. I think the most interesting uh, thing in fall camp that we're going to see from defense is going to be the front line uh, that we started this, this podcast talking about because they need to get those guys better. How do you get better in fall camp? Well, we're going to see but they need to get them ready, especially since they didn't have a spring. If there was any position group that needed the spring the most, it was that one. And Jaleel Taylor wasn't going to participate in spring, so they were going to get a lot of reps in with some of those other guys that must step their games up. They're going to miss from that. Absolutely. Yeah, that you get, like you mentioned in the beginning of the video, you got to have a solid defensive line to, to make sure everything behind you works well, too. So, obviously, this not having that spring practice is always going to affect you in a little bit, but still a lot to be optimistic about, that, especially at that linebacker position and especially in the secondary, just how deep it is. But, yeah, we've, we talked about the offense, talked about the defense, a lot to op be optimistic about on both sides of the ball just because, you know, Carolina just didn't lose a lot of guys. Maybe they lost some guys that didn't get a lot of snaps or didn't play a lot, but for guys that played a lot last season on both sides of the ball, they're returning a lot of those guys. So, Kyle's got to be feeling pretty confident and pretty excited going into this season. But, and I've been Jacob Turner. He's been Andrew Jones. Thank you guys for tuning in. Doing a few of these spring football 
practice podcast. Obviously, the Tar Heels weren't able to practice, but we're still got a lot of access and we're able to get some good information on everything. So if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like, be sure to share, um, be sure to subscribe if you've enjoyed it. We'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.